to play ball. Welcome to the podcast with no limits. Whether it be sports, current events, or random thoughts, this is the place to step in and stay a while. Your host is a proud alumnus of Rio Hondo Prep, a former minor league baseball umpire, and a man with strong opinions. Welcome to the Get Home Safe podcast and your host, Matt Persima. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Get Home Safe. It is a Friday edition of the podcast. So we have a wonderful guest for you guys today. We've had a few great ones the past few weeks, and we want to keep it going today. Today, we're going to be joined by Matt Brown. Not only is Matt Brown a fellow podcaster, uh, which we'll talk about his podcast, just a good conversation that he's been doing for about a year now, but Matt Brown is a professional photographer. And he and I uh, crossed paths at Cal State Fullerton when he worked there in the athletics department. He's done all kinds of photography all over for different uh, professional teams, college teams and such. So I'll let him tell you all about that. Hopefully I have my facts correct there. But he's, uh, he's done photography professionally for 35 years. So a lot to talk about, including his great podcast that I think you, sh- you will uh, all love. But let's bring him on the program first as he is in the waiting room. And uh, there he is, Mr. Matt Brown. Welcome to the Get Home Safe podcast. How are we doing, Matt? I'm doing great, man. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. And uh, it's cool to do a podcast with someone who's got the uh, the equipment. For those not watching on YouTube, Matt, Matt's all geared up and ready to go. Oh, yeah. we got to do this right. We're not going to half-ass this podcast. No, sir. No, sir. You know a thing or two about that, about doing podcasts. And Matt, uh, you know, I told the audience here briefly that, you know, our paths crossed at Cal State Fullerton uh, when I was working kind of a little bit there with the athletic department. And you were always a professional photographer taking all the action shots and everything. So that's kind of where and we chatted a little here and there. But I think today we're going to catch up, learn a little bit about each other and, and have some fun. Um, you, you've been a professional photographer for 35 years. Uh, you were telling me off the air, but you started up this podcast, which I'm always intrigued by fellow podcasters and how they got their start, because this has been fun for me to just do as a hobby. Um, what was the influence on you starting up a podcast of your own? And just tell us a little bit about a good, just a good conversation, your podcast. Yeah, it's, um, it's something I think people miss is just having a conversation. Um, you know, going back a million years, like my brother and I, Adam, we would want to watch Duke's Hazards on a Friday night. And it was the same night that Dallas, the TV show was on. <clears throat> so my parents, we live next door to Tom and Mary Hale. They would, uh, we would have dinner all together. And then they would go next door to Tom and Mary Hale's house and watch Dallas. And Adam and I would watch Duke's of Hazard. And then they would spend like my parents and Tom and Mary Hale, like two hours and they would discuss the show. What did JR do and she do? And they wore and they had a uninterrupted, like two hour conversation about a one hour show. (laughs) And like those don't happen anymore. Those kind of conversations where you could just talk to somebody and not be disrupted by an email, a text message, a phone call. Like it's rare. Um, it, It almost it's impossible to have. And even with a child, right? Like young kids now have phones. So they're getting barrage. I mean, I got young boys here in the house and, you know, we have an older son who's 28 and we have a younger one who's 15, like the way of raising those two with the technology of a phone and the way of communicating was totally night and day. Like when Grant went out, our oldest, he would have to come and check in. Now with our oldest one, we can see where he's at on the app and we can text him and we're constantly in communication where when Grant went, we would hope he would return, you know, the wild animals wouldn't kill him. <laughs> and so having those kind of conversations are, are great to have. And I think it, it really is something lost. So uh, I love, you know, I, as a photographer, you spend a lot of time like in a photo. Well, especially baseball, there's like three hours of your life. You're never getting back. So you can sit there and banter about, you know, your boss, the wife, the husband, camera companies, like you name it. So, uh, conversations are something I really, really enjoy having. Awesome. Well, that is uh, a big reason you're on here today. And my podcast, you know, I, it's, it's evolved. Uh, what I started as to where I'm at now, it's still got some work to do, but 
kind of that's what I do on my Friday episodes, which you're you're a part of uh, for this one, is just talking to someone really about anything. But I like talking about their path in life, what how they how they've grown from the beginning, where they grew up, their high school, their college years, and, and what they've uh, done professionally and all their experiences. Sure. But it's also nice to talk about, you know, opinions and uh, get takes or, or, you know, argue about sports and things. So uh, I got to imagine, I haven't listened yet. I'll be honest. I haven't listened to your podcast <laughs> yet, but I'm, I, I've already gone through the guest list and I've, and I've seen a few that I cannot wait to listen to. Uh, Mike Greenlee, Mel Franks, uh, John Wilhite was on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th- that one I might listen to first because John, uh, you know, the, the terrible tragedy he was involved in, thankfully he survived, but um yeah, I, I remember sitting at a scores table with John Wilhite at a basketball game. We were both students and just, uh, right. you know, it's, so it's just crazy that he was a part of that and can't wait to hear that. But uh, I did notice some of your conversations are, are two parters. Is that by design or it just really goes by length? Like uh, there's no time limit. Like John's was actually one of the shorter podcasts uh, tragically because he doesn't remember much of the incident. Wow. So as someone, someone to interview, he has no time lapse or period of his life a week prior and literally up to like 30, maybe three months to six months after the incident, he doesn't have full remembrance of his, his memory of the incidents are people telling him about the incident. So you start to put the incidents together in your mind, little, little, like little Lego pieces, putting together this bigger piece. So, I mean, it's sad. And I wanted to, you know, I, I love John. He was one of my athletes at Cal state Fullerton. He was always great. And I wanted to sit down and have an honest conversation with him about like what it was like pre post and during that incident. And then there's other ones. Um, you know, uh, Michelle Gramacki's was almost like four hours. I had a, a one with uh, Don Barletti that was like over three hours. And it was only supposed to be an hour and a half. And he was late to dinner with his, with his family, but he was having such a good time. Um, and again, uninterrupted. That there was nothing that broke his concentration. Just two guys bantering about photography. It's kind of nice when you don't have a time, a time frame and uh, you're just chatting and, and- I mean, we've all done that without doing a podcast. Like, I don't know how many times I've sat on the couch right. with, my, with my brother watching a, a couple games and all of a sudden six hours has passed. And it's like, wait, where'd the time go? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. But, but back to uh, just for those that don't know, uh, John Wilhite played baseball at Cal State Fullerton. He was the only survivor of a car accident back in 2009 that killed uh, Angels pitcher Nick Aidenhart, who was 22 years old, as well as uh, Courtney Stewart, who was a Cal State Fullerton cheerleader and uh, Henry Pearson. So John survived that crash and uh, yeah, just a, a tragedy. And, and thank God uh, John did survive, but it's just stories like that, that, you know, you hear about Matt, I think I remember when it happened and I just, you count your blessings on a daily basis. You're like, Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, it's weird for me as a parent, that's how I look at it. Like I want to sit down and talk to his mom and dad. I mean, talking to John is like, yeah, let's talk to the source. But really, the the stuff his parents had to go through and sitting and interviewing John and talking to him, they made all the decisions because John was not capable of making decisions. I mean, he's 20 years old and he can't tell you what was happening, what medication he was on, uh, decisions on, you know, life and death. His mom and dad had to make that. And that is hard Mm. as a parent that would eat me alive. And, and so that, yeah, that, that's some interesting parts of, of a podcast or a conversation with people that you pick up that, you know, in that podcast, his his parents made all the decisions for him because he couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Man, what a, what a crazy, crazy time. Uh, And yeah, as a parent, that's gotta be, you know, I, 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 that's one thing. That's kind of how my, my podcast started with the title. There's a tribute to baseball and things too, but you know, people always say, Hey, get home safe, get home safe, you know? And, right. and sometimes we take that for granted because situations could come up like that where, you know, with John Wilhite, where you just never know, man. So every day you gotta, gotta count uh, as never a blessing. Know. I've driven through that intersection. Yeah. I mean, I've driven through that intersection so many times. I, I mean, does it only take one idiot who's drunk 
mm-hmm. to drive through and change lives like that. That's all it takes. You know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, well, you talked about you enjoying conversations with, with people and just, uh, talking about anything, but what was the moment for you? It's like it's July of 2020. Uh, I think a lot of people started podcasts last year, right. Uh, you know, with downtime, but what kind of was the, the genesis for you of, okay, finally diving into this whole podcast and talking with people. So it really started earlier than that. Um, I have two older brothers, my older brother, Mark, seven years older. Um, and we're a lot alike. Like he, we play the same sports together where my other brother, Adam was more like a, a music guy. He wasn't a big sports guy. Um, he's not really political and that's fine. Right. You, that, those are the family members you have. And so Mark and I, on my way home from work on Wednesdays and Fridays, uh, th- Mondays too, sometimes we would call and we would talk on the way home. Uh, he lived up in Tahoe, Adams in Virginia, and we would talk for an hour about sports he's a huge Raiders Lakers fan um baseball when we talk politics um and and it's no holds bar especially when it's a family member and like <laughs> we're not going to get mad at each other and say I'm never talking to you again like you could with like a co-worker at work and we had very opposite political views and, and that was the best part of it like it was never mean or hatred it was just trying to like convince one person maybe see another side or a different opinion Um, we would always talk about, you know, measures and ballots and, uh, the way I look at politics, I believe it's very, uh, the way people look at it is opposite. Like the federal government has like the big banner, but it's not nearly as important because people in your city council or your mayor can change your water bill on any Tuesday night. (laughs) But the federal government has all these other cogs that slow it down, which is another part of its problem. But if your water bill or your trash or your ambulance, uh, you know, costs can get changed by five people, those are the people you need to look at first. So it's, for me, it's always city, county, state, and then federal, but federal sexy, right? So you're, you know, you got your bumper stickers on for, you know, the hell with him and up for him and this and that. And, but no one ever has city council stickers on. And those are the people that can really screw you. So Mark and I were always talking about that because, being that he's in Tahoe and that city is split between two states, California, Nevada, which are completely opposite politically on the way they're run. So you got a city that's run differently, two states that run it differently. So we would always talk about that. And um, so at one point, I mean, this was going on for years as talking like this. I said, Hey, let's, let's start a podcast. Just the two of us, you know, just like you and I are doing, we're doing on a computer. Um, he's not very tech savvy. And I said, I'll, I'll set it up. I'll get us a laptop and, you know, I'll make it work and a microphone. And he's kind of like, yeah, you sure. I'm like, yeah, you know, be two old guys just sitting screaming, hollering about whatever, right. We'll put it up. And if six people listen to it, whatever, we've changed six people's lives for better or worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what we thought. So, um, Mark was extremely healthy. Like he would, he was a uh, head of the children's ski school at Heavenly. He would ski all the time. He would paddleboard without a life jacket, which would drive me nuts. He'd go on Tahoe and he knew the whole lake just by people's patio lights or the lights on the lake. Like he would, he, he can navigate through the stars and stuff. He was in the Navy. Um, and so this was before, this was on a thir- Thursday night because the Lakers are going to play. Yeah, the Lakers are going to play uh, Milwaukee on Friday. So I call him and I leave him a horrible brother message like, you know, you know, call me back. You know, LeBron's going to get his butt kicked by the Greek freak. You know, your team sucks, whatever. Just riling him up, r- what brothers do. And um, he doesn't call me back, which is not like him. And it turns out that while sitting on the couch in December of 19, uh, he has a massive heart attack and passes away watching sport center which if you watch sports center now i think a lot of people would rather uh would 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 die on the couch than watch sports center it's turned in such a crap show so (laughs) (laughs) so he he go he goes on yeah he goes on the couch and uh and and so i was like damn it now i just lost my podcast partner now i have no one to banter with so i was like all right well for him i'm gonna kind of like rebrand it and think how i'm gonna do this so i took a couple of months 
And with my wife, we sat around and we kind of come up with what it is today is just a good conversation, just finding people like my brother or just random strangers and have conversations with them and, and to know more either about their career or their path or their decision makings and just have conversations with people. Because I, I honestly believe if we do more of that, then we will be better off as people than posting stupid emojis and crap and likes and dislikes or whatever you want to call it. Like my life has never been better getting a thousand likes on Instagram, but my life has been better just by like helping someone go into the where, you know, into Home Depot and opening the door for them or, or helping a, you know, an older woman, like get her groceries out of her car, something that makes my life better than likes and emojis. And I think that's where we need to get to is like, put down your phone, have a conversation. Amen. Life, will be, life will be good. Life will be good. Amen, Matt. Man, that is a, a lot to unpack. I mean, I, I, that's so <laughs> yeah, I just dropped you off in the uh, airport loading dock of, <laughs> of luggage right there. <laughs> well said, well said. No, I, I mean, I, it's been a uh, you know, a year and a half or so, but that's uh, it, to our point, we talked about, about, you know, John Wilhite, you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed your brother, very, yeah. very healthy person. And just a random shot. And my condolences, man, that's, that's, yeah. that's horrible to, to hear. And I can't even imagine that. Um, but then kind of as a tribute to him, you go forward with this podcast. Right. right. I think that's great. That is awesome, man. Yeah. That's what he would want. He would, uh, he'd be pissed off at me if I like curled up like a baby and cried in the corner and didn't do anything about it. <laughs> so, and being the youngest, like you, you get tough, that tough skin. So yeah, I'm going to forge forward. And, and it's a nice, it's, it's a weird icebreaker when people ask if you have a guest and they ask like, Oh, so how did you start this? And it's like, well, I don't want to see you cry, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Like this podcast, guest is from my heart the way I, I conduct it and find my guests and, and go about it like I'm, I'm actually putting real effort into it like mark would want that's awesome man um yeah absolutely and and what how do you start your conversations is it all kind of the same for me i i kind of want to know about people's life path and what motivates them what has given them inspiration to do what they do or is yours is, is there a script is it kind of just totally random or what it's all over the place, depending on, on the people, um, you know, with John Will Heights, for instance, it was, uh, what got him into his love of baseball. Right. And then without baseball, John might not have been in that accident, right? Like there's paths. We have little teeny paths and they all lead somewhere. His dad played baseball and that was his path into baseball and, and his love. He wasn't an elite athlete. He was, you know, just a guy on, a, on great teams and he embraced that and he was totally for it. And so with John, let's, let's talk about baseball and we'll weave our way through his story. Um, where there's other people on, I've had like real estate agents and it's purely, let's talk about the market. I got a buddy of mine, Scott on like this time last year when things were going bonkers. And I just want to talk to him about like, Hey, give me some pro tips for people buying a first time home, people selling and getting out of here. Like what, what should they know? Um, and, and that kind of stuff. So everybody's got an interesting story and angle, but I don't follow a, a formula because it's just an open conversation, like mm -hmm. sitting down next to somebody on the plane. You don't just say, you know, Hey, let's start with this formula. <laughs> you know, when, when I was asking people to come on, some people were terrified. I'm like, first of all, yeah, this isn't, this isn't live. And the number one question, what are we going to talk about? And I'm like, do you go about your life that way? Like, okay, yeah. walking around with a list. Here's what I'm going to discuss today with, yeah. uh, with people. I mean, life is unscripted. So you have to kind of, I don't know, there, there's some bullet points like I wrote down, but sure. In general, it's just like you're saying, let's have a good conversation. Uh, people ask me all the time, what has been, and it may be tough. Maybe, you know, you love all your conversations, but what are a few of your favorite episodes that you have done? Ones that left you afterwards going, man, I really enjoyed that. Uh, that was an absolute pleasure. I'm sure they all have, but. Um, yeah. I mean, they all are They're They're all been really interesting. Like um, I had coach Taylor on the men's basketball coach at Cal State Fullerton. Mm. And originally I just wanted him on um, to talk about uh, leadership, leadership with uh, young black men, right? Because that's the majority of his, his basketball team is, is 
is black men. And so we wanted to talk about like the trials and tribulations he has to go through to, to deal with, you know, uh, a lot of those guys have difficult upbringings. They go to Cal State Fullerton because it's not Duke. It's kind of like a last stop. It's not like your first, you know, stop on your checklist. And so I wanted to talk to him and I've admired him uh, a lot because he came in young and he's gotten so much better and he's matured as a coach. He brought in the right coaches, John Smith and some other guys who've gone on. And so I really like coach Taylor. Um, I knew there was uh, some health uh, events that happened for him, but I didn't know exactly what. So when he walked up, uh, for the interview and we started talking, I saw the scar on the back of his head. And I said, Hey, uh, what do we got going on here? And he said, I had, I had a tumor and I want to talk to you about it. So on my podcast was the first time he talked about it openly. And that's why that one was a two parter. It was almost, almost five hours because the first, first part of the podcast was just him leadership, his career path, all the decisions he made. And the second half was going through this tumor during COVID completely alone. Like his parents couldn't visit him. Um, it happened like on a blink of an eye. He went in, he had migraines. Next to me, you know, you got a tumor the size of a pancake in the back of your head. So that was a real interesting one. Um, Dave Martinez, who ran the La Habra Boxing Club, um, where I used to train as a, as a young boy, um, he never, never talked about his military career. And there were all these rumors about Dave was like this badass in the Vietnam war. And like, you know, he killed a man with his thumb, right? Like he's teaching boxing, you know, he's got to, he's got to kill somebody with his thumb. That's what you do, right? You know, you don't need to use your gun, you use your thumb, you're, you're a badass. So I finally, after years, like 20 years of wearing him down, uh, got him to open up and talk about his experience in Vietnam, his, why he opened up the club. And he was not a badass in the war. He was a medic and he was saving people with like some of the most obscure trauma tools, which led to his cut man career, which led to boxing. Wow. So he won. Yeah. Right. Wow. So he was taking some of the things he learned in Vietnam and using it in the ring. And he, he was awarded a silver star, which you don't win a silver star, you, you're awarded. And um, yeah, he, he all the stuff. So like he really opened up for the first time ever on my podcast or with people in general. Like I had long time people email me saying like, I had no idea. Like that was not what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was gonna be like a Chuck Norris episode. <laughs> and it turned out to be like this sweet kid, you know, and his brother. Stay, trying to stay alive in Vietnam as medics, which medics see like the most gruesome things. And we talked about losing men on the battlefield, keeping men alive with like just the most basic primitive tools available to them, running out of plasma, you know, for days on end and being pinned down. That was a real, like one of those ones where you're like, dang, I am exhausted afterwards. This was like a real, like brutal conversation because i mean i don't know how yours are but they're like first dates because you're not interrupted with a phone <clears throat> so you're just staring in it and you're listening to everybody's words and if they say something that's going to break off you try to make a mental note oh, like oh i gotta jump back on that come back around on that and um there's some people in a podcast that they can they can leave you all kinds of nuggets that you've got to ask you have to ask yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, big time. That, that is uh fascinating. Well, uh, to your point, yeah, I wrote down uh boxing cause I've gotten into boxing uh, the past few years, MMA too. I love not me personally, but yep. watching it. And so, uh, oh. yeah, you, you said you, you trained as a kid in boxing at a box. Yeah. Game? I, yeah, I grew up in La Habra, this little, uh, you know, in the barrio and, uh, <laughs> you know, to stay out of trouble, you know, that's where the kids went to the La Habra boxing club and, laced them up and beat the snot out of each other. <laughs> no, that, that's funny. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You either do it here or the streets, you know, learn it, uh, how to do it technically here. At, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny, like a guy, 
now this is the eighties. This guy's training me. And then 30 years later, I have him sitting down on my podcast. It's yeah. really like, it's really weird. Well, the whole, con- like you said, being a, a, a medic, a combat medic. And then that leads to him being this cut man. I mean, that's, that's an incredible story. You could write a book on that almost. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. His story, his story is worth uh, a look at. It's, mm. it's unbelievable. They well, don't make human beings like that anymore. Oh man. I, 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 like I said, when I try to remember how it happened, I think I saw, I was friends with Will Hyde on Facebook and that's where I saw the, your podcast uh, episode. Mm-hmm. I went, Oh, Matt Brown has a podcast. So I went and I looked at all your, all that you had done. And I'm like, okay, I can't wait to dive into this. Cause I'm a huge podcast guy. I love listening right. to it. That's what I do all day, really. And, um, I saw that and saw the names and man, uh, coach Taylor and, uh, Martinez there. I, I got to listen to those. I can't wait. So those are just a few examples of some of the great, good, excuse me, a good conversations that, <laughs> that just a good conversation that you have on your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Once a week, every Friday we drop one. Um, and I, and I'll talk to anybody. Like I just had a guy on, uh, Ron Henry, who is, a uh, who does lawn, uh, Bermuda lawn golf courses in Georgia. And I've got Bermuda lawn and I found his YouTube channel like six years ago. I was trying to buy a Scott's lawnmower. Mine died. And I saw his YouTube review and it was God awful, but you know, six years ago it was fine. And uh, I followed him subscribed ever since the stuff's gotten <clears throat> way better. And um, now he's got a full fledged company out of it. And I'm like, I got to have you on. I love the fact that you went from trying something like, Oh, I need to try this product out. I'll review it to you created a business out of it. And so that was our, our conversation is how did you make a business from this? Mm. Cause I always love that angle of how people can finance it, come up with the ideas, make a business plan and generate something from it. So that's a lot of times I'll look at my podcast from the business side. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, do I, I should say, how do you, most of your guests, are they people that you know indirectly, or, you know, you talked about that guy, you didn't really know him, but uh, how do you go about finding your guests? I've got, I've got a list of like 170 people that are ready to come on. I just don't have the time. I, I keep saying, if I win the lotto, I'm going to keep doing the podcast. The problem is I have to play the lotto to win it. Same here. So, so <laughs> It's that's not going to help me, but a lot of them are people I know. And then a lot of them are people that, uh, it's like the degrees of Kevin Bacon. Like I know them from a friend, from a friend, or I've worked with them through the industry. Um, and then there's just random people. I have no idea who they are, but I got to sit down and talk to them. And those I find are the most interesting. Yes. I agree with you. I've, I've done a few where I had no idea who the person was, uh, introduced to me through someone else. And, or had never really talked to them before. You know, I had mm-hmm. a, a, a NCAA basketball official, uh, Tony Padilla, who I'd never, I chatted a little bit with when I was the, the mon- replay monitor guy, but never had right. talked more than five minutes with. And so to do that was a blast. I talked to a football coach uh, who coached in the NFL in college and now in high school. And that was fun. So yeah, sometimes those are the, those are more fun because you're learning, you're hearing for the first time, like the audience is when you know somebody, you kind of know a good portion of their story already, but sure. those can still be fun too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then, I, I mean, I do a ton of research on my guests. So even if I know them, like, like Greenlee, I know him real well, like, but I still did a ton of research on him. My, my writing partner, Phil Thurman, I had him on and I do a ton. My best man in my wedding, um, Jay Seidel, I, I did a ton of research on them because there's still something to find out. And then there's angles and twists. You know, it's like writing a story. You just don't want it to be plain. You want it to have some, some interest in it. Definitely. Well, uh, we will maybe talk some more about uh, your podcast uh, towards, <laughs> towards the end here. Promoted, of course, guys out there listening, you got to check this podcast out. Just a good conversation with Matt Brown. You can uh, find it anywhere you uh, listen to podcasts, I'm sure. Uh, but Matt, let's talk a little bit about you now. You're a professional photographer, but I always kind of ask people to tell me about uh, their early years, the beginning, uh, where it all started. So uh, where did you g- grow up, Matt? And what was uh, life like for you as uh, a young kid? 
uh, I grew up in La Habra, which is, I'm in Fullerton right now, so it's not that far away. Um, raised by a single mom for eight or nine years in the uh, lovely barrios of La Habra. It was always a good time. Um, I had uh, my uncle and my grandfather always had cameras. Um, we didn't, my mom did not have a camera, but the guys did. And it was kind of a, a, a the man chore, right? That might not be politically correct to say, <laughs> but you didn't have a bunch of single moms or moms taking pictures. It was always the dad's job. Dad took pictures at the bar mitzvah or the wedding or the whatever, right? It was very rare that the wife or the girl or martinis and cigarettes, right? They, they, they weren't taking pictures. So I would watch my grandfather and my uncles take pictures. And I was like, wow, like the way everybody stops and that magic when you take that picture and then you want to be in that picture. And then maybe if you took that picture at Easter, maybe on the 4th of July, you might see those photos if you go back over to grandma's house because it was not, I think it was an instant. Um, and to see those photos and then you're like, oh, that's what I wore at Easter or that's what we had for, for Thanksgiving. Or, and it was like these time capsules being captured. And I found that to be just absolutely intoxicating. It was the most, like I've never done drugs and that was the close for me as a young kid, like, oh man, this is awesome. I gotta, I gotta be a part of this. So uh, fortunate, my mom met this uh, wonderful man, Tom, and they got married in 1980. Um, he was my dad. And then for a wedding gift, he got a camera. And so he, I got a camera. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I started to use his camera, our camera, all the time. And that only lasted so long because I was taking it everywhere. And then I would spend my allowance on the film. And then the following week, spend my allowance on developing and take it to that little fox box, drop it off. And two weeks later, I'd get it. Um, they gave me a subscription of Sports Illustrated. And with that, I got my first little plastic camera. And I would run around all over the place with that plastic camera, shooting everything, everything, whatever we did. If we were down at the creek playing, we went fishing, surfing, whatever. I took pictures of everything. And it was the only thing I ever wanted to do was to be a photographer. And that was it. And that's really, by like the 80s, that was it. There was nothing else I wanted to do. So was, did you do it any was off and running? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you do it like high school? Were, were you part of, I don't know, was there like a photography club or, or things like that where you kind of yes. de developed, no pun intended? Every. <laughs> that, right. All that cliche, I did. I did the, because that's all I wanted to do. So we didn't have an elementary school, but we had it at junior high. So I was on the yearbook, yearbook in high school, the newspaper, which I got kicked off on, which is always <laughs> fun when they invite me back. I always say, oh, I got kicked off of this newspaper here. Um, <laughs> And that was only because I was trying to do in a, I was trying to do my best Mike Wallace, like 60 minutes and do an investigative piece on the, uh, the uh, money being spent by the students. To, uh, and I thought it was inappropriate and nothing came of it, but I was doing my best Mike Wallace, like tan jacket, like let's make a story, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I did it all. And then I, I was taking all the classes in high school and I was told by, um, a, that there was a, the booster cub president for football was Joe Kennedy. And he was a staff photographer at the LA times. They said, talk to Joe. He could totally like hook you up. So I played football in high school and talked to Joe and he's like, Oh yeah, photography is great. I could totally help you out, whatever you want to do. And so he started taking me to like Raiders games, Rams games, SC games. I'd shoot stuff. I'd shoot stuff on the sidelines. He would shoot high school games and he was showing me things. And like, that was a huge door being opened up. Now I have a professional LA times photographer, like mentoring me, showing me, giving me all this advice. I was so far ahead of the curve above everybody else having like literally this like free tutorial all the time. And then he tells me, hey, you know, you could take college classes and not have to be in college. And I was like, well, what? He goes, yeah, grade doesn't matter. 
So in the summer, I was taking photo 101 at Fullerton College. And then I took the following year, a portrait class. So now I'm doing like my sophomore year, I'm, I'm learning from Al DeVito at Fullerton College, who was a professional photographer, who actually one of the people that developed the 24 hour developing lab or the one hour developing lab, he developed that. So I was getting like all this insight. I'm doing college work in high school and it just evolved into like this huge thing immediately. Like, cause I was getting all this mentoring and input from these professionals at like the lowest level. So it was, it was a huge snowball rolling by the time I got out of high school. Wow. That's uh that's awesome. Now you said you played football. I always find it interesting when kids don't play sports, uh, some kind of sport in, in it. I don't know what growing up or in high school right. anyway, because it teaches you so many lessons. It teaches you how to prepare, how to, uh, you know, maybe go through some physical adversity and, uh, you know, you could do some of that in schooling, but let's be honest. It, you learn more, I think on a field or a court than you do in a classroom oh, at, yeah. at times. So to kind of playing sports kind of, uh, give you the experience or kind of motivation really teach you how to pursue something such as you did with photography? Yeah. I mean, I played everything. So I played baseball, uh, basketball, football, and then I had a buddy, Jamie Hutcherson and I, when we met, we said in, in school, we said, we should try to letter in every sport, see if the letter in everything. <laughs> Uh, we tried to go out for swimming and diving. We were kicked off the team because neither one of us knew how to dive other than <laughs> cannonballs and swimming. I had no idea they swam that long. They're like, what the hell are you going to kill us? So those are the two we didn't let her in, but I let her in track and badminton and, uh, oh, men's tennis. I didn't let her in men's tennis. Um, uh, but everything else I, I ran cross country because, uh, at the time in the early eighties, my mom uh, was working at Byersdorf. And one of her uh, partners was uh, Rich Mendoza, ran uh, cross country. He ran 5Ks, 10Ks. So he got me into that. So I was running all these like five and 10Ks uh, in junior high. So I continued that into high school. Then I ran track, uh, basketball, wrestled. So I did everything. I was not afraid to like go out for everything and then be that social butterfly and meet as many people as you can and do that thing. And then I was taking my kids camera with me all over the place. So uh, yeah, sports was huge for me because I wanted my sports photos to look like you were in the huddle. I wanted you to feel like you were a part of the team. So Ooh. I was subliminally, if I'm sitting on the bench and the coach is talking to us, I'm taking a picture. I wanted you to be there as well. Now, I did not realize you can't do that at a Rams game, sit on the bench and take a picture or a Lakers game, but I wanted you to have that intimacy that was happening. So I know, I know we're jumping ahead here, but when I got the job at the Angels or even at Cal State Fullerton, I wanted to put the viewer in that spot. And so I did that. I had my camera with me all the time to the point where like, I would grab my camera before I grabbed my keys in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, it, it's it sounds like a simple concept, but I, I got to imagine it wasn't always isn't always simple to your point, like you said. Uh, but what a great idea to take people inside, you know, because uh, that's really what the viewer wants is to know yeah. what it's like to get closer, to get access. So, uh, yeah. man, that's cool. You telling me, uh, Matt, you didn't you didn't specialize in one sport like kids do these days. You you played no. them all. <laughs> no, Jimmy Crow and I didn't play travel ball all over the country or something. No, it just wow. We we played, you know, whatever was happening. And uh we never had a professional team name. You know, we were never the Dodgers. We were like Rick's plumbers or you know, <laughs> Gary's electronics or you know, uh, you know, whatever whoever sponsored us, you know pizzeria mama's you know pies whatever that's great um yeah we, we had none of that travel ball stuff we just played and then like during the summer if we weren't playing something my dad would take us to work uh, he worked at long beach airport so adam and i would go to long beach airport and we'd get a golf cart and uh bb guns and we'd drive around the airport and shooting pigeons off of uh, multi-million dollar planes so they wouldn't mess up the paint jobs and like that was our 
summer job. Like we didn't go play a travel ball in New Hampshire or something. Yeah. <laughs> I- I can just picture you in a golf cart driving around with a BB gun. Yeah. Like we were two nine-year-olds like that. I mean, this is how different the world was. Like we were two nine-year-olds. We were given a golf cart and a BB gun (laughs) at Long Beach airport, which had Boeing, the national guard, the the airport didn't have jet blue, but it had the terminals. And we would, we, we drove everywhere. Like we would drive into Boeing. We would drive over and see the national guard guys. And we just had, you know, a box full of BBs and we'd just be shooting birds all day long. And it was our job. You'd be put in jail today for that. My father would be put in jail yeah. for allowing two kids to drive around on a, on a runway. Right. Yeah, social services would be showing up at, uh, you know, and taking our gun and beating us and we'd have to rehabilitate all the pigeons we shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally different. Huge public apology. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. And therapy. <laughs> uh, we probably, we probably saved about $30 million in paint over our career. So, you know, somebody has got to do it. Absolutely. That is a great story. That that's uh, one of the best things I've ever heard. I mean, that was the best summer jobs we had. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Sign me up as a 36 right. year old. I would do that in a heartbeat. Right. Uh, <laughs> I got a golf cart and a gun. Like, okay. Stop right there. That's funny. that's it. We're done. <laughs> oh man, alive! We got to recover after that one. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, playing playing sports, multiple sports, gives you a, a great outlook and, and teaches you a lot of different lessons. I'm sure. Uh, so after high school, you had already had this kind of experience with photography. Uh, you you were ahead of the uh, of the curve, as you kind of mentioned. Um, did you continue at Fullerton, uh, college Fullerton JC or kind of what was, what was after high school? I went to a photo school up in Santa Barbara Brooks. And then I I took course to also taking courses at at Fullerton college. And then at that time, uh, Photoshop was coming along the technical side. So I was taking, uh, some photo Photoshop courses at orange coast college because they had them Fullerton didn't because it was like this new technology. Like we forget it's so easy now. Like most people can have like a Photoshop version on their phone, but in 1991, like having a computer that was able to do Photoshop was still pretty wizard like, and not, not all the schools got on board and, you know, God love, you know, Cal state Fullerton. They were, they were so far behind. They were thinking, you know what? We need to build a second library. Really? <laughs> like, so like schools and the way they divided up their money and Fullerton college did not think Photoshop was happening. And someone on the technical side at OCC did. So between all the school districts in orange County, they were the only one that had a, had a certified Photoshop class. So I had to take it because that's where the industry was moving towards scanning and working on it digitally. So college up in uh, Santa Barbara, you said, uh, did you get much studying done up there or uh, was it kind of, yeah, your- <laughs> because it was a photo school. Okay. So it was different than UC Santa Barbara. Yeah. Um, which, you know, nobody got any studying done there. They just exchanged <laughs> STDs. That's about it. <laughs> you know, but there was very, very little got done there, but no, being at a photo school, like only 400 people and they did cinema. Oh. Uh, it was, totally different, totally mm-hmm. different. Um, that, that was some, some, some real learning took place up there. Very cool. Well, so you had kind of this, I don't know what you would even call them, uh, not really internship type, uh, work. When, when did you kind of after college or maybe during, what was your first or early, I don't know how you would ter- ter- term, term this, uh, your early jobs in, in professional photography. So like there was the internships and applying and everything else. Like, uh, like I said, my dad was working at Long Beach airport and he, his company had this photo. They needed some photo of equipment needed to be photographed. So I, I put in a, 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 an attempt at a bid for it. And he, I ran through all the gauntlet and you would think like, Oh, you're, you know, you're going to get it. And he said, no, your bid was horrible. Like you didn't, I didn't even like your bid and I didn't like this and that, and I didn't even get it. But that's how that's how uh, how tough it was. Like my dad was not gonna just give me the job, and I had to learn uh, the right way and finances and business and like how you do it. 
Um, I applied for a little uh, uh, internship at the Fullerton Tribune. Oh, at, and this is to go back. But even in high school, um, I befriended uh, Stan Bird and Jack Hancock, who were at the La Habra Star, which was our local newspaper, which was a bulldog edition, which meant it came out at three o'clock. Uh, most newspapers come out in the morning. So I befriended these uh, two characters and they took me under their wing and I was a paper boy. There used to be this thing called a paper boy and he had a bicycle <laughs> and he would take newspapers and put them in his bike and throw them at people's lawns. And so I had that job and, and, and I would listen to these guys and talk to them and, and they would say, you know, Oh yeah, you gotta, you gotta know this guy and know that guy and this guy's great. And, and they told me about an internship. And, and so I got an internship at the Fullerton Tribune and that led to a, a position at the register. And it was just off and running. Like there was not a job I wouldn't take because I always looked at it as adding more paint to my palette. Like as much as I could do, I would do it. And I would assist anybody I could. Like I started assisting the SI guys and the NBA and Andy, Andy Bernstein here in LA and anybody I could, I would work with. Yeah. And I mean, did you kind of know it's all you ever really wanted to do? You were telling me, but you know, I, not, there's no offense here, but like some people, they hear photography and some people think, oh, that's a nice, that's a cool hobby like that. But yeah. they, don't, oh, they, don't, sure. they don't always think of it as this uh, career, you know? So was that kind of a challenge and knowing that you were hoping that it led to something, but you, you didn't really know at the time? No, I knew it would. Um, both of my parents have business backgrounds, so they were real um, tough on us business-wise, laying out like how to look at anything as a business. Mm. Like my, like I remember Adam and I approaching my dad to get a raise in our allowance, and we were like, "Oh yeah, so we'll uh, we'll clean up the room faster, or we'll uh, mow the grass quicker." And he's like, "Yeah, no." I'm not going to give you more money for doing something you're already doing. He's like, you got to give me a proposal on. So we had to write up a business proposal on what, how, how to get one more dollar a week and what we were going to provide him in return. So there was never like, I never took a, a career path or a decision made without like having it thought out thoroughly. So I knew getting into photography, it was going to be a career and I had all the infrastructure and foundation behind me to be like, okay, I know I have to have this kind of capital. I got to have this kind of backing. If I get a loan, a small business loan, this is what it's got to do. And so fortunate I had that, that backing and beginning to help me. So I never looked at it as like a chance of failing. There was, there was nothing but going to be success. Wow. That's awesome. And you know, this, uh, you know this, but man, you had some wise parents. <laughs> That's a great yeah. story. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not paying you more for the same thing. Like, what a yeah. concept. What, they, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing for me? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. No, no, no. That's great. Yeah. They yeah, should be so uh, running. We had to weed whack and we had to rake up more leaves and we had to, you know, wash a car and we had to do more mm. for more. I know yeah. that's an interesting concept. I, it really <laughs> is. It's, it's so foreign these days. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> Especially in government, they get paid more to do less. It seems like, right. Uh, but, I know that's where I always say my high school counselor failed me. I don't know why my high school counselor didn't tell me, Hey, you know, you should get a nice County or state or federal <laughs> job. You know, I know this photography thing's fun. You can enjoy it on your off time on the weekends, but get a nice County job, retire with 95% invested. You can retire by, you know, 45, you know, be a slug. It'd be great. Oh, we have a uh, very similar viewpoints on. Uh, now, you know, yeah, you know me saying this, all of your county and federal listeners have just turned off this podcast. Yes. And they're no longer. I do have many of those, many of those <laughs> listeners to my, to my knowledge. Yes. Uh, that's, that is so funny. So Matt, tell me about sports. Did you, did, were you open to all uh, really photography or, or did you know sports photography was, was your heartbeat, was your lifeline? No, it just kind of fell into that way. Um, it was not going to be the path. Like I wasn't going to be like, I'm only shooting sports. It was just, I was very good at it and people just started kept paying me for it. So if you're going to keep paying me to go to a baseball game, I'm going to keep going to the baseball game. Um, if you pay me to go to a wedding, I'll shoot the wedding, whatever. But it just became to a point where when I was at the register, they just kept giving me, uh, 
uh, all the sports assignments. And then I was single, right? All the other guys are married. So like, they don't want to work nights or weekends because they got family obligations. So I would go to the Laker games. I'd go to Dodger games. I would work the SC games late at night or during the day or double headers, whatever. And it just became a thing where they just kept feeding the beast and I just kept chewing it up. So if you're going to pay me to go shoot, I think in 97, I did 40 of the 42 Lakers or 41 of the, uh, Lakers, Lakers regular season games oh, man. that happened to be Kobe's first year and Shaq's first year in LA, but nobody like, and this is Kobe was just a kid, right? This isn't Kobe 2001. So at the staff, the guys didn't care because they had family obligations and stuff. So, Oh, if he's going to do 41 games or 40 games, big deal. Kobe so, Bryant's rookie season, man, you got right. some great shots. I'm sure that other people did. Yeah. So you got the best seat in the house. I got to imagine. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, so it, it can be, I mean, it's, you're working, but be honest. I mean, did you ever look around and be like, I can't believe I get to do this and stand or sit right here. I got to take pictures and I got to focus, but man, this is pretty awesome to be a part of this. No, no. I knew very early on, especially with Joe telling me stuff, Kennedy at the time, like it was a blessing to be where I was at. Like you don't get, I mean, I've never paid for, courtside seats olympic boxing i mean i've saw tyson chew off ears and you know guys knock each other out and all that good stuff i've never had to pay for a ticket i've always been there someone's paid me to to be there um to the point where it's funny it's 25 years later like i'm at a game at the forum that's how long ago it was nice and donald trump is sitting behind me and it used to be really tight like their feet used to be like right behind their your butt sitting there and uh, he's like, wow, you got the best seat in the house, young man. And I was like, not really. I said, you get to sit in a chair. I'm sitting below ice. The Kings are playing. And this, you know, I got hemorrhoids growing the size of softballs here because of this ice. You know, so you're, you're meeting people like that. I met Paul Allen when he owned the Blazers. Um, so, yeah, it was never taken for granted. I always knew I, I had a special job oh yeah very and, and and what are some other big events you, did, we, did you mention tyson were you at the fight when he bit evander yeah. holyfield yeah bit evander holyfield um like i i've been to i've covered super bowls world series stanley cups uh just just about everything like everything uh the college stuff bcs pre bcs i forgot what they even used to call it you know <laughs> before there was even a a, a get play in game, just games, like everything, Rose bowls, upsets, um, people's final games, Ryan Leaf's final game, you know, whatever I've been to a bunch. I saw John Elway win his first super bowl. I saw him lose his second super bowl. So wow. it's like, yeah. Um, saw the angels win, saw the Dodgers lose. I saw the Yankees win. I saw the Padres lose. Like I've, I've seen it all. It's been great. I've had a, you know, don't tell anybody, but I've had a great, job at this yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> well you know we, you're fortunate to be in southern california it's a it's a really rich area for photography in the sports world because there's two basketball teams there's two baseball teams uh, now there's two football teams at one time right. there, there were two football teams two hockey teams i mean you name there's uh, soccer teams now i mean a ton of universities in a small area so uh was that that well, how should i say this you you had a lot of opportunities here in Southern California, but it sounds like you traveled quite a bit as well. Right. And don't forget, we also had surfing, right? So we got the, the we got surfing and there was this kid coming up that a lot of people forgot about this kid named Tiger Woods mm. in Orange County. So I would cover him, whether it was US Open, when he played at Hacienda and other places. So yeah, there was there was a lot of other stuff. People get caught up in the, the big four. You know, we had racing, NASCAR, Long Beach Grand Prix, uh, tons of college stuff. But yeah, I was, I've been fortunate enough to travel. Uh, I worked for uh, SI, ESPN, the magazine. So I traveled with them. I've been to, you know, Ohio State and Florida and Washington. And I've, especially when, when I started working at ESPN, the magazine, and they wanted to really compete hard with SI, it was to the point where I was on a Wednesday, I would leave depending on the, the time of the year, I would cover the Thursday night game. 
whether it was college basketball or college football or college or the NFL, because at some point the NFL plays on Thursdays, mm -hmm. have Friday off, travel, do a game, a college game on Saturday, do the NFL on Sunday, do the Monday night football game, come home on Tuesday, rinse and repeat and leave on Wednesday and do it again. <laughs> and that was it. Like it was constant. And like, we don't understand if, and, I, and the best thing about this podcast is anybody in the world can hear it, right? It's not stuck in Orange County. So if you go to a, a UCLA game, it is so vanilla, so boring. And I love UCLA. It's a great school. You know, um, they got decent football, but it is not the Midwest. It's mm -hmm. not the South. It's not the Southwest Conference, Southeast Conference. It's not Big Ten, Big 12 it's totally different. Like we can sit out in November, you and I, and have our Brie treat cheese and crackers and our little white wine and sit there at a golf course and wait for a game to start. Right. Not, not at Ohio versus Michigan. You've started six weeks prior cooking, whatever you're going to make. And it's a bloodshed. And I remember my first trip to Ohio state and uh, I'm with ESPN. I'm covering, I, I'm doing a story on somebody, maybe it was Trestle or whoever it was. And it was my first time at Ohio state. I've covered them before other places in the country, but my first time at the horseshoe and I'm looking around and it was like the opposite of children of the corn. There were no children. There were no children anywhere. I was like, where are all the kids? It's like, this is weird. Like there's none where I'm parking, there's none tailgating, there's nothing. So I go to get my media pass and I say to the, the woman, I said, hey, um, <laughs> jokingly, is this 18 and over here at the football game? And she goes, no, son, we take it serious here at Ohio State. We don't waste a ticket on a kid. <laughs> I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> uh, okay, all righty then. You're not in you Kansas anymore. Right, you got 100,000 people and these people are here to like gladiators to see a war. Like yeah. they're not here to like sing you see LA and there's no bear. No, no. It's the gut some Wolverine, right? Like that. It's all serious, totally night and day, like just absolutely. And so I ended up pitching the story a year or two later at ESPN to do a story. And we did it on the girls that babysit at Ohio state. These women are making a fortune because they're babysitting tens of thousands of kids that day. Because if you're a parent and you got, then Gary and Sally have two kids. That one girl will watch those eight kids for 12 hours that day. And this happens all over Columbus. So it's like this Saturday daycare system that nobody thinks about it's its own economic like branch off of the football game. <laughs> so there's like 15, 16 year old girls that are pulling in like $500 a day. Yeah. And, and the parents, if you have spent big money on these games, you'll probably pay anything for, uh, anything. Know, for their babysitting. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a great story, man. Yeah, they ain't bringing no kid to some Ohio State game. <laughs> Sit there. This is too important, son. I was just like, oh boy, yeah, oh boy, yeah. yeah. Those are the those are the stories in my career that I've always loved to find because there's always layers to that onion that's more than the mm -hmm. game, right? Mm -hmm. Like just diving in, like games in. So Wyoming, there's that's the only university in that state. It's the only D one. There's nothing else surrounding it that really can touch it. When you go to a game there, the whole town shuts down. It's it. That's all they're doing. Everybody's watching the Cowboys play. You don't get that in, you know, LA, San Diego, uh, you know, Miami. There's so many other things going on, but when you have a little town like that, that is fortunate enough to get a college in it, that's it. That's it. That's all they want to do. Watch your Cowboys play. <laughs> that's true, man. That, that is true. I, I love that small town aspect, that small town feel. Oh, it's great. Uh, it, it's, it's incredible. And uh, I mean, it's like you, Virginia tech and Blacksburg, it's middle of nowhere in the mountains. 
Yeah. You know, people don't think about that, but it's like in the middle of nowhere. Penn State's that way. Absolutely mm. middle of nowhere. Wait, so, so you, I mean, you, so you were working for, you said Sports Illustrated and also ESPN, the magazine at different yeah. times. Okay. Yeah. And so you, you mentioned all this traveling you've done, all of this, uh, uh, these great venues and incredible memories. And, and hopefully you'll share a few more with us, but you mentioned it earlier that you were single. I know you're not, where did you fit in time to uh, find the future Mrs. Brown at this during all, during all this? <laughs> uh, at, at a party at a, at a, at a 4th of July party, I, I, I ran into this woman and uh, it was uh, love at first sight. And then uh, there was a Halloween party where she showed up as I showed up as a uh, a typical uh, as a basketball player. There's nothing like a, a, a five seven white basketball player <laughs> dressed up with my best friend who was dressed up as a monk, which uh, I don't think you could do either one of those outfits. But she dressed up as a pregnant geisha girl, and I was like, and I was like, all right, I gotta talk to that girl. Like this girl's, I like the cut of her jib. I'm yeah. gonna talk to her. That's hilarious. And, and so, yeah, we've, we've been together, uh, ever since since like 92, 93. Wow. Yeah. But, but, to, but to your point, I mean, at some time in the, in the early conversations you had to say, yeah, this is what I do. So I'm gone most nights and weekends. I don't really have a whole lot of time, uh, you know, to, to date. So how did that go over? Well, it was, it was interesting because, um, she didn't date a lot of sports, people in high school so she didn't understand the relativity of time like baseball doesn't have a clock <laughs> if i say there's two minutes left in a basketball game that doesn't mean two minutes that means like 45 minutes so when we were dating and i would say like oh um i'm watching the game and there's like a quarter left how much is left in a quarter 15 minutes she would think okay you're 15 minutes to the game and then you're like 12 minutes away so i'll see you in 30 minutes two hours later later after an nfl game like it's just so that took her a while to understand time has no relevant time in sports like it could be forever and especially tv playoffs like that can drag on forever so um she she's an absolute gem because she's bought in early to my career she's been there through thick and thin um, and she never, ever once wavered and said, God, I wish you had a regular nine to five job or you didn't travel as much. You didn't do this and that because, you know, we, we've been fortunate. We've had perks. I got a bazillion, you know, miles and Marriott nights. And, uh, in 2003, I surprised her, you know, we always go out for Valentine's day. You know, you do that in young love and like 10 years later into our marriage and we're still going out for Valentine's day. And I got assigned, uh, a Lakers game on valentine's and i was like oh man you're gonna kill me like i'm supposed to go out with the wife so olga uh sweet photo editor great photo editor we had the register she's like um i'll give you a sec i'll get you a second pass and you can take your wife i was like all right perfect and she never been to a professional sporting event at that level i've taken her to events but never at that level so i remember picking her up at work and saying when i pick you up at work don't be in your work clothes being like regular clothes jeans, sweater, uh, tennis shoes. I'm going to pick you up. We're going to go somewhere. So she's like, all right, whatever. Sure. Uh, he's going to surprise me. We go to LA. So now she's thinking we're going to LA, but now we're going to Staples center and she's all confused and we're pulling in and she's like, Oh, you're taking me to a Laker game. And I was like, no, <laughs> we're working the Laker game. She was like, wait, what? I can do that showed her her credentials. She went in TSA, get the pat down. We go have the really bad media meal. She goes on the court. She's enamored by Rick Fox and how gorgeous he is. And, you know, uh, Farrell's right there on his Blackberry. And we're sitting on the court. Like literally she was sitting on the court for a Lakers game. And she was just like, like, a, I never knew her when she was eight but she had the look of an eight-year-old. She was just absolutely taken away by like this whole like experience of like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> That's smooth. That's smooth, man. Yeah. Got to work. Hey, eh? yeah. Got to work. Man's got to make his money. That's gotta, it. Yeah. He's like, you get to do this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But That's then I've got plenty of people that are like, Oh man, I'd go to any game. And I tell them, okay, well for a Laker game, I normally get there at 1230. And they're like, but the game's not until seven. Yeah. I got a lot of setting up to do. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. I just don't roll in and like sit down with my camera bags and there just be like, uh, never mind. No, I'm good. <laughs> well, and, and to your point earlier, like, and, and then try to sit on the ground or take a knee or whatever for three hours while, you know, focusing, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not easy either. Nope. Not at all. <laughs> no. You know, sit, sitting on uh, we have these, uh, we, there's these chairs, padded chairs, but sitting, sitting Indian style, you know, legs crossed on ice, right? There's ice under that hardwood floor. <laughs> it gets you. It wears oh. on you. Oh yeah. man. And then yeah. you're trying not to get killed by people flying all over the court. Oh, oh yeah. Well, well I asked that, you know, the, the relationship thing. Cause like when I started dating, uh, you know, my girlfriend, it's, that's kind of how things were. Hey, good to meet you. Hey, by the way, I'm, I'm usually gone quite a bit, gone uh, <laughs> nights and weekends during the baseball season. And uh, almost half the year I kind of travel it. So, uh, but hopefully this works out for us. So uh, <laughs> it's interesting other professions that kind of have those, uh, those types of things. I mean, we're not in the military or anything, but still, no. you know, being, being gone is like, uh, you know, it's not always, uh, goes over well. So good for, yeah. Good oh, for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. So sitting courtside, uh, literally on the ground. I mean, do you ever have any, uh, any, any scary moments of getting run over or anything? Plenty. Ooh, plenty. <laughs> I I've been hit by, uh, football players. Uh, Shaq took me out in 90, 99. Or 97, oh. 97, 97. Yeah. You can probably find it on YouTube. <laughs> um, he, they were playing the trailblazers. It was game three. I'm shooting with the register, Mike Goulding and I, we switched spots at halftime because he wasn't having a good game. And uh, shall get Shaq gets fouled by uh, somebody and he goes flying into me and I have my, 7200 in my hand and I throw it at Paul Allen because he's sitting next to me because I didn't want it between Shaq and I and Shaq just completely laid me out just on top of me sweaty intimate moment with uh you know Shaquille in front of 17,000 people at the forum and broke a couple <laughs> of ribs and uh that was actually the start of our, our friendship and so we've been buddies ever since but yeah it's uh you get crushed a lot and that kind of stuff. I oh got, man. Uh, I forget. Yeah. The, the present, yeah. The presence of mine though, to save the camera. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Cause it would have impaled me, not him. Oh, uh, Dallas Clark crushed me on uh, Sunday night football at a game, uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, the, the line marker guy stepped right out of the way. And then there he was, Ooh. he was right on top of me. Boom. Um, yeah, but that's, that stuff happens. It's part of the, you know, if you want to get there and make intimate photos, you got to have to eat it once in a while. So get your nose in there, man. That's Absolutely. right. Could be uh, worse. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine getting Shaquille O'Neal on you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. It was, uh, it was quite pleasant. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. How do you explain that one? Uh, <laughs> the next day, uh, that, that is so cool, man. And, and have you had your experience kind of with your wife, uh, there with Valentine's day, have you been able to kind of take your, take your sons around and show them, uh, give them some, some of these great moments too. Yeah. My, uh, my oldest son, um, he, he assisted me when he was younger. So I've dragged him all over the place. Um, my youngest boys, um, them as well. So in 13, I became the director of photography for the angels for four years through the 16th season. And I traveled with the team. And we'd go out to spring training and spend six weeks. It was like a grind. So uh, part of the deal was I told my wife because my youngest son, his birthday's in May. My wife and I and my middle son have our birthdays in August. Our anniversary is in October. Uh, typically, 4th of July is our big holiday for the family. We have it. So I would say like, okay, where if we're teams out of town, I'm, I'm flying you guys out. So I've taken them to D.C., Seattle um, Boston, uh, Phoenix. And, you know, we stay with the team. So like my little squirts don't realize that like eight years old, they're staying at the Ritz Carlton in Arizona, you know, in like a suite jumping up and down, hanging out with, uh, you know, Mike Trout in the elevator or, <laughs> or Cole or Hector Santiago or something like that. And so they, they've been really fortunate to, uh, see a lot of the country, um, when dad's working and, and meet some of these players, like 
you know, they got autographed balls and bats from, you know, Howie Kendrick and Mike and shoes and stuff like that. So they've, they've been blessed to uh, ride dad's coattails on some of those experiences. Yeah. You're going to tag along for sure. I mean, uh, you know, for <laughs> us, for us, normal, normal folks, we don't get to, uh, you know, just randomly show up courtside like, like that. Uh, yeah, the, no, you don't. Yeah. You know, uh, Matt, I'm a, you know, official, uh, referee by, by, uh, at least I was at one time, did a, a lot of umpiring and things. There's, there's one situation. I don't know. I, you have to remember this. I'm sure it's a women's basketball game. And I, and I typically defend officials, but in this, <laughs> in this situation, I was like, why are we picking this fight right now? It was a women's basketball game and you were oh, yeah. at a Cal state Florida game and you take photos, you know, courtside, but I don't know the tech technical terms or whatever, but you set up like these flash strobes uh, strobes. Right? Yeah. Up in the, up in the uh, air or whatever. So it's connected to your camera. So when you take a picture, you get proper lighting. So you were taking photos like you've done a hundred times before. And this official was like, we cannot have those flashes going off during the game. And uh, do you remember this? You want to take yep. over from there? Yeah. Yeah. It was against Pacific. It was, um, it was one of those experiences. So I was even on the NCA committee for um, very early in my career. I was told like, be a part of committees, be ahead of the curve, work, work with the rule committees, all this stuff. So I was on the NCA committee for photography and rules with like Porter Banks and some other guys. And oh, wow. so I knew the rules. I knew them all. There was not a rule. I didn't know. I would, I would photo marshal NCA events and stuff. So I had to know them, but big West would hire me for stuff. And she just had one of those bad days and she wasn't going to admit she was wrong. So <laughs> uh, the game is starting and my strobes are up. They're in a legal position. They're properly, you know, this is technical, but the flash duration and all these things are, are correct. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. And she says, these aren't allowed in a basketball game. I can't photograph. I can't do this. I can't do that. And she just wouldn't get off it. And I just kept telling her very calmly, like, listen, <laughs> let me help you. You're wrong. I'm right. What I'm doing, they've been up here for 15 years now. You've been in this arena when I've used them. You've been at the Big West tournaments when I've used them. Like, I don't understand. And this conversation is happening every time she's going back and forth up and down the court or when there's a timeout or during a foul call to the point, like she was holding the ball, holding up a free throw to have a conversation with me. And I'm just like, Oh lady, like you're <laughs> killing me. Like I'm watching you implode. Like you're, you're absolutely wrong. And she said, uh, listen, if you take another picture, I'm going to tee you up. And I was like, okay, now you're foolish. Now people don't realize this, you can tee up bands, fans, but the penalty goes to the home team, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to affect Pacific. And I'm like, you're not going to do this. And she goes, I am. I'm going to. And so they, well, they go down court. I take a couple of pictures. Boom. She tees me up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, you're so wrong. <laughs> we had an SID at the time who wasn't the brightest bulb on the tree. And he came up to me and he's like, can you just stop? And I'm like, I will only because Marsha Foster was the coach at the time. And I've known Marsha for a very long time. And I'm like, I'm not going to do this to her. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to keep shooting and screw her. And she's got 40 technical fouls. So I stop, but I tell the official, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to file a complaint and you're probably not going to work for a long time. And then she gets on me and she's like screaming and she's taking it personal. And she's saying some stuff and it's just like, all right, I'm going to win. I'm feeling bad though for you because whatever you brought and you know, as an official, like you're not supposed to bring your personal life to the office. Yeah. Something happened. She got a ticket. She, someone dinged her car. Someone shot her dog. I don't know, but she brought it to work. Yeah. And so I went over to Steve the at the time and I told him, I'm like, Hey, this is what's happening. And then he called the commissioner. The commissioner's calling the head of officials they go in to talk to her at halftime and she's like screaming and hollering. And I'm like, listen, I'm going to pack up and go, but I'm filing a formal complaint. Fullerton's paying me to be here. Now I can't, I'm losing this day. I, the, it was towards the end of the year. I, I couldn't get another day. in. it was just an absolute mess. Long story short, she gets suspended. She was, she was found in the wrong. Absolutely. NCAA, like, mm -hmm. 
I got on her and she did not work the rest of like three more games. And then she couldn't work the tournament. And I ended up seeing her a year later and she came up and she's like, I'm so sorry. I had a bad day, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I let her say her thing. And I said, listen, I said, I get it, but you need to listen to people. I said, you were absolutely in the wrong and you can't do that. Like you cannot like, let's take this as a teaching moment. Sometimes photographers are right. <laughs> she was just like, Wah. but, but I I've had instance like uh, two years prior to that in 07, I got thrown out of a baseball game because an umpire uh, told me I couldn't be on the field. And, and so I got thrown out of a game uh, at a, uh, at a Fullerton baseball game. And, and Rick who Vanderhook was just retiring actually had to hold me back from charging the uh, third base umpire because so, so what happens and you know, this, right? Like if you have a three game series, they set the ground rules on the first game mm -hmm. and those ground rules apply throughout the game. So if they say, you know, that part of the fence is a home run. This is not, that's, that's foul ball. That's fair play. If it hits that trash can, like what happens? So on every Friday night, whoever the coach would be was when it was George, when it was Dave, when it was uh, Rick, they would always say, Matt can be on the field. He's fair play. The ball hits him. It's fair. So that on Friday night, I shot the game and they went over the rules and I actually was out there shooting the coaches exchanging lines lineups so i heard the conversation like a hundred other times <laughs> i don't shoot on saturday i shoot on sunday first first thing into the game third base coach or third base uh, official is telling me hey you gotta get gotta get the photo well i said no i don't i i'm fine here he's chirping at me again and him and bradley talk in between innings and then bradley says you know you gotta move and i said i don't you know george told him and george yelling out like hey i already told you he's fine so third base guy and I are chirping again. And I said, I'm not leaving. And this is in between now the second and third inning. <laughs> and he goes, if you don't leave right now, I'm throwing you out. And I said, if you're throwing me out, everybody's going to see a show. And he tossed me and I dropped my gear and thank God Rick was there. Cause I charged him. And I was like, you stupid son, you can't throw me out. Oh, God, I'm supposed to be here. You know what? You're just dumb. You're stupid. You're fat. Like I just went all Billy on him and just went and Rick's holding him back. And Rick is the man who has no fuse. Like he's the pit bull <laughs> yeah. and he's now the, the monk in this situation. He's in my ear telling me, Hey, calm down. You're embarrassing yourself. Like, Oh my God, you're spitting on me. Like he's holding me back. So I go up and I grab all my stuff and everybody's laughing. And I go to the well, I go up to the top and Mel had been in the bathroom and didn't see what was going on. He's like, Hey, what you doing up here? I said, I just got thrown out. He's like, no, you didn't. I said, yeah, I just got tossed. He's like, well, that's a first. I thought Cliff and I had just seen about everything and my photographer gets thrown out of a game. Well, the same thing happens with that. Like um, those guys were in the wrong and they got suspended the next week. The big West suspended them. And I actually saw the first base a first base umpire the following week at a Fullerton college baseball game. He was double dipping going down and he's like, dude, I knew you were in the right, but I had to back my guy. He's like, you know, he was the, the crew guy that day. And you were right. You actually had the permission on Friday and it carries over yeah. to the weekend. And I was like, well, maybe you should say something before it escalates <laughs> to a circus. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like a, a coach who knows maybe the umpire was right in the situation, but he's got to back his guy, you know, the got to back his guy, you know, that's just, that goes around uh, all over the place. So that's all funny. over the place. So technical fouls, uh, getting ejected, uh, yeah. Matt. I mean, man, you're really doing the Lord's work out there. Well, the <laughs> you know, I try to give the fans something other than, you know, just taking pictures and you know, I want, I want everybody to keep themselves on their toes when Matt Brown's around. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. That is, that is so funny. I've never ejected a photographer before. For, but uh, the day's early. See yeah. what happens. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, incredible uh, stories. So, with, with Cal State Fullerton, you worked there a long time. So, how does this all work? It's you worked for specific magazines. You worked for the Angels, as you mentioned. Is it kind of like you're you're a free a freelance guy, a free agent? You can work for a magazine and then also a school, or how does that all work? Yeah, it's just, it's like regular freelance work. So 
I had been with Fullerton since 99 and other magazines and you just apply and you go and you, you take your book and you know, you, you make your pitch and you try to tell them why you're so valuable and why you can make your, uh, their company better and produce a great quality product for them. So, uh, I with Cal State Fullerton and Fullerton college, and you just kind of, you have to juggle a schedule. Yeah. Um, and you know, you have to prioritize, um, you know, and, and it's just like any kind of regular freelance job, just knowing who and when you're available to work for. So the good thing about like with Fullerton, you know, their schedule way ahead of time. Like I know in November when the baseball season's laying out so I can lay it out. And then if you're doing work for, let's say for ESPN and something's coming up, a big story, someone's coming out of the closet or someone's got a steroid issue, whatever, you go cover that. You just juggle the schedule around. Um, Fullerton's always been great because there's so many games in there in my town. Mm -hmm. I was able to juggle that schedule, especially with when it was Mel and Mike um, to make it always work. So there was never any conflict or anything ever being missed. Well, if, uh, if people want to see, uh, some of your work, where's the best place for uh, listeners to, to check that out? Uh, it just, you know, I mean, you, you can see a sample of my work on my website, mattbrownphoto.com, but so much of my work, um, really kind of never gets seen like for Cal State Fullers and I might shoot a hundred thousand photos in a season and they might only use 200. Uh -huh. So you're, you're kind of at the mercy of other people's um, use of your photos. When I was with the angels, we had a, we had a, uh, a photo blog that we turned in from nothing to like the number one photo blog where we had a hundred thousand people a day looking at it. So like, that was fantastic. Um, so yeah, it, you know, you can find on, on Instagram, Matt Brown on Instagram. I post a lot of my work there. Um, but you know, it's kind of with the client. If they show it, that's where it's at. Okay. And, yeah. and uh, if you had to, uh, I'm sure, you know, as far as memories and things, do you have a, a few, a handful of specific uh, favorite photos that you have taken over the years, maybe a significant moment that you have a picture uh, that you've taken and you're like, I don't know, it takes you back or you're just, you're extra proud of it or just sentimental with it. Yeah. I mean, there's, I've been fortunate with quite a few and like, um, like I'm trying to get, uh, uh, Ricky Romero on my podcast and it's really just talk about this photo. So in 05, right, he wins it in 04, but in 05, we lose, uh, to Arizona state and the super regionals on the Sunday, it's game three. And I know Ricky's been drafted. He's number one draft pick. And I know it's his last game. And you have to know these little nuances of like what's going on, who's, who's last game, who's this, who's that. And I knew it was his last game. And uh, Ricky is uh, an absolute sweetheart. Like he's not, he's not an assassin, right? Like he's lovable. He's got a great smile. Like he's going to be like a great dad. He is a great dad. And I knew he was going to do something emotional like he was going to take a moment where um i wasn't sure what but i knew when the game ended no matter what i wanted to be on ricky so arizona celebrating Vinny pisano's walking out towards the outfield people are crying like babies and ricky slowly walks out to the pitcher's mound and i mean a half a second he kneels down and he swipes his hand across the rubber it gets up and walks off i'm about 10 feet in front between home plate and the pitcher's mound i compose it correctly where i have the whole circle him the scoreboard arizona hats are all spewed out you can see Vinny pistano in the outfield leaning up against the wall crying and you can see ricky just touching the mound you just see his back you don't see a name on his jersey or anything but that one moment i like that moment better than Windsor with his arms up in 04 because everybody got that because that's what you're expecting, right? You're a moron if you don't get that photo. But to have the insight and to be aware of when special little moments like that happen, that separates like real historical photos. Yeah. Real, 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 real photos. Now, the Windsor photo has probably made Fullerton a million dollars in visual, you know, return. And it's going to live forever. 
the Ricky photo, I have autographed hanging in my office, not the Windsor photo. Mm -hmm. Well, it means more. Yeah. Oh, it does mean more. And the emotion of, of him uh, going on to bigger, better things, but that, that emotion that a lot of people have experienced in some walk of life for most of us, it was the last time we played a high school uh, sport or whatever, but for him, that was the last time he was going to be in contact with the pitcher's mound at Cal state Fullerton. And he went on to have a great big league career and everything. Right. Right. That's a uh, man. Very moving. Yeah. I mean, um, another one similar to that. Um, she's an absolute sweetheart was Chelsea Patterson. She's on the women's soccer team. She's absolute leader, midfielder, uh, beautiful girl, great smile. I love the way she played. Uh, she blows out her knee like mm. three weeks before the season, bad blowout too. Like not like just ACL, but like total reconstructive, the ugly, the ugly knee brace, the one that looks like you know, they're going to have to give you a new leg team goes, uh, it's her senior year. So she walks out there with one shoe on the giant leg brace. They put her on the field and they let her go out there and they kick the ball to her. They let the other team know they kick the ball to her. She touches the ball and then she kicks it off the field and then she waves to the crowd and then like limps off. Well, I, I had known that was going to happen. So I set myself in the position to between her and I wanted coach Brown Damien behind me because I knew she was going to try to make some kind of visual eye contact with him. And I wanted her line of sight through me. So as she's doing that, like she's crying like a baby, I can hear Damien crying like a baby. And I'm glad I had my camera up because I'm crying like a baby. Cause it's just this so sweet little moment of like watching, giving her just a little bit back of her athletic ability. Like she's totally recovered and fine, but she missed the chance of winning in the tournament, playing in it, like everything. It just strips from you. So I wanted to catch that. And it, you know, in the, the athletic lore as a whole, it probably means nothing. But to me, it means way more than maybe when the men won the tournament a couple of years ago, because there's a significance of that girl, how she built that program, kept it going her personal connection and like those little moments, what it means as an athlete. It's so difficult to get there and have it stripped away from you like that. It's, it's hard. It's hard to watch that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh man. It, there's a, there's an ending for everyone and it's not always the way you want it to be. And so to capture those moments uh, it is incredible. I mean, what, what would you, I've only gone home with the winner once. In 2004, right? Oh. So, right, I went home with the men's team in 04 as a champion. I've gone home, you know, with the bridesmaid, second place, the loser, <laughs> hundreds of times. Yeah. Right? So that's just, those become the more, like, Frank Robinson walking out with Mike, the trainer, in Omaha, walking through that tunnel, absolutely crushed. Frank gave it his all. And there's all these screaming Wisconsin fans and there's Frank being held up crying. Like those photos mean more um, than the winning photos because you you're there with them more. You see more of that heartbreak than the, than the celebration. And so I, I've gone home, you know, runner up way more than I've gone home as a winner. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all have. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as, you know, we live we're like, this will be on YouTube and we're recording and it, there's a lot of, we live in this age now of a lot of video clips, right? Whether mm-hmm. it's Snapchat or TikTok, Instagram, uh, all, all these different social media aspects, but are you a firm believer still that still photography is, is it, it says more about a moment than maybe a 10 second video clip? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I don't care how things change and become 8K holographic, you know, three-dimensional scratch and sniff. Like there's still a photo. Doesn't matter if it's personally to you or historically that can incite passion, pain, like you name it. Like the 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 photo of Neil Armstrong's boot on the moon's surface. Like you see that, boom put you in place in time. Um, you know, the, the monk setting himself on fire in Vietnam, like it's little photos like that, where 
you just see that photo and you go, Oh man. One of my favorites that- is, uh, George Washington kneeling by his kneeling in prayer, I think at Valley Forge. And, uh, you know, that's back when it wasn't the photography they have now. It's basically, you know, paintings or whatever. Right. That's one of my, my favorite, uh, uh, photos I'd love to get someday and and have up on the wall somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to replace, uh, still photography because it will always bring you back to that memory. Mm. Always bring you back. No doubt. Pick. Yeah. yeah, What's the old uh, pictures worth a thousand words. I mean, that's cliche, but it's true. Right. Yeah. And everybody's got a camera now because that damn phone, everybody could take a picture. Um, you know, uh, what really separates, uh, the, the, the professional photographer and the great professional photographers is the ability to make a photo, not take a photo, your camera on your phone, you can push that button and you're taking them, but to be able to make a photo, and have it just absolutely have emotion in it. Um, that's the difference between the men and the boys. Oh yeah. Well said. Well, cause yeah, everyone thinks oh, I can just take a picture of my phone. They think they can do what you do or that it's just as good. It's just about, it's the same thing, but right. it's not true. There's so much more, as, you, as you've already said throughout this whole podcast, that so much more that goes into it and capturing the right moment, not just blindly shooting stuff uh, right. with, with a, you know, Nokia or whatever. <laughs> um, so has that, you've talked about your past and kind of where you've been up to now, kind of what is your, I got what is your present, if you will. And and then what is the the future look like for you? 35 years. I mean, you're going to keep doing this forever. Some people, when they retire, they go into photography, but for you, it might be the opposite retire and get away from photography. No, like I'll I'll always take pictures. It's not going away. It's part of my, my DNA. If I don't take pictures, I'm an angry bear. Like I get real grumpy. Um, so yeah, I'm always going to take pictures, but I've got a lot of irons uh, in the fire. I'm always doing something. Um, I mentioned him, Phil Thurman. He's my writing partner. We write uh, movie scripts. So we're, we just finished a, a movie script and we're working on two more. Um, I love woodworking. I'm trying to get a project where Mike Greenlee and I can actually uh, build something. Um, I got my podcast. I got my family. So like, I'm not going anywhere or slowing down. I, I'm always finding something to do to keep busy. I am, I would be the worst person on a, on a cruise ship because there would be nothing to do. Like if I was on the Titanic, I would have fixed it before it gone down just because I would have had, I, let's do something. Um, let's patch this bad boy. <laughs> you know, like there's, what the hell, why is the band playing? Yeah. Let's go. Come on. That's get great. That wood. Matt. Yeah. We'll get that tube. And we'll use it to clog yeah. that hole. <laughs> Um, like I just, I, I don't do good sitting around. I don't do good on vacations that aren't, uh, adventurous. Like yeah. there's no, no way I'm a, a sightseer. I want to go like, go do something. So I, I'm always going to take, uh, photos and, and go out there and make them and, and push the envelope and try stuff. Um, I, I work at Incipio right now, which is a tech company. We make phone cases and power cords. And so I'm their lifestyle e-commerce studio photographer. Um, it's really nice. It's a much slower pace Monday through Friday, nine to five, which I ended up now having a nine to five job. So the wife's kind of happy with that. And I could be home with the kids and go and watch baseball and track practices and games and be home. And it's nice. It's yeah. nice to, uh, to have things at this point in my career where I'm calling the shots and doing what I want to do instead of going to Ohio state, not watching uh, non-childless football games. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You get the plenty of great stories from that. And kind of before I forget last year, you know, 2020 crazy year we had where uh, for a few months anyway, sports was shut. Everything was shut down, but sports uh, kind of just disintegrated uh, and then came yeah. back. So what was that like for you and your peers? Uh, I was an umpire without games to umpire. I mean, you're a photographer without games to fo- photograph. Yeah. I mean, I, I was shooting the women's big West basketball tournament the first two games at the pyramid, they didn't have fans. No, we didn't have to wear masks, but we didn't have fans. It was like, that's still like, we had no, no idea what the hell was going on, but we'll just make up rules kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> all you heard was squeaky shoes and people screaming at each other. Cause there was nobody in the game. Um, and then they called it that, that, uh, third Thursday, Thursday at the, uh, Honda center. Um, I was posting, I stopped because I was posting like, so I'm working at the studio in Incipio and I was posting like all these videos 
on my feed at Instagram of like me working alone, me doing this, me doing that. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to stop this because there's a bunch of photographers who aren't working. Like mm-hmm. They don't have a job right now. Like probably 95% of the industry, 97, like was not working. Newspapers were letting people go and there wasn't any sports, and, you know, freelance work was like drying up. The big industries were stopping to stop work. And it was just kind of like, I'm thankful I had a job at that point because it was getting really ugly. Um, even big places like the Apple photo studio in Culver city shut down for a long time. Amazon shut down its photo studios. And it's not like Amazon's hurting for money and they're looking for coins in the, you know, cushion of the couch. Like they got more money than they know what to do with, but everything got shut down. So it was weird, um, to talk to some of my buddies and they'd be like, yeah, I'm on, I'm on unemployment and I am going to have to sell gear Hmm. because I got to try to make it through. And then once you start to sell the gear, like, so people understand like a 400 millimeter lens costs like $12,000. You're going to sell it for 5,000. You're never going to be able to make enough money to buy that 12,000 again. So like, once you sell it, you're screwed. So like there were people selling to stay alive and knowing it was over. Like they were going to now work at Home Depot. They couldn't, they couldn't go back. So it was for, for the industry, it was pretty, pretty ugly pretty i mean i i was very thankful that i that i had a full-time job yeah and guys like you to your to your point you aren't going to recover from all of that i mean they gotta find yeah it's 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 been that way for a lot of professions uh this past year year and a half and it's it's sad um so it's 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 good to see that you uh made it through matt and and things are still going well for you um kind of lastly as far as you know there's a saying uh you know a mailman never goes for a walk on his, on his day off. Right. So as someone who followed, uh, was around sports all the time, did that take away at all from your interest in sports? Maybe your love of sports. Do you still watch a ball game on your, on your day off? Or is it kind of like, you just want to get away from it all? No, I do. I still do. Um, if there's a football game on, I'll watch it. Uh, I'm uber competitive. My, my kids always said like, I oh, should have uh, coached football. Uh, that's like my passion. That's my mistress. I can watch and play football and do football all day long. Yeah. Um, at any level. Like mm-hmm. I remember I was taking a trip through Texas. I stopped in Odessa just so I can see the stadium. Yes. Right? Like if, if you're going through, you might as well take a look I, I at did it. the same thing. Pulled right. over it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's take a look at this bad boy. What do we got here? <laughs> and you go, wow, that is big. It is Texas. It's a little um, different than La Habra high school. <laughs> oh yes. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I'll watch. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely watch uh, sporting events. I mean, I don't watch the NBA much. Um, just politically, I don't like the way they're going. I'll, I prefer college basketball. I'm with uh, you. The, the NFL, I'll watch. I'll watch college football, um, hockey if you can find it. Good <laughs> luck, you know, trying to find hockey on TV. Um, but all the other stuff, I'll, I'll watch it. I, I mean, I'll watch as much college baseball as I can. Oh, yeah. I'll watch college baseball over pro baseball. Me too. Just because I, I just really enjoy the, the way it's being played at that level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Professional baseball has changed so much. It's all uh, strikeouts and, uh, you know, home runs. And uh, those, I guess, are exciting. But I don't know. The, those guys are being paid so much money now. It's just, it's totally different. You get that old college try, you know, with the college ball. Um, right. I mean, that that's the biggest thing for me is like, I can go to a game and watch, you know, Irvine and Santa Barbara and I'm watching some good baseball and I, and I know what I'm getting and I don't have ESPN barking at me like, Oh, this is the greatest player since sliced bread. Like I don't know much about the new Japanese kid at the angels. He came before, after I left, but funny. Yeah. I, if I see another goddamn story <laughs> that says that he's better than Babe Ruth, like I'm going to reach out and slap someone in the mouth because can he just make it through a season first? Yeah. Right. Can he play up? Can he play 150 games? And then the way we statistically look at stuff, Ugh. okay. Babe Ruth hit and you cannot compare apples to oranges in time. I get it. The bats were different. Pitching was different athletic. Right. But I'm sure Otani's never played drunk. I pretty sure Babe Ruth has played with a hangover. <laughs> right. Otani never swung a four by four. Grab one of Babe Ruth's old bats. Mm-hmm. That thing is like swinging a four by four. <laughs> it didn't have, 
he didn't have a little special thing on his finger so he didn't feel vibration or anything like this, right? Like, like the guy's not hitting over 300. The guy's on pace for 200 strikeouts. Like, are you kidding? Joe DiMaggio's rolling over in his grave watching mm. these guys play baseball. So, like, stop this. Like, he's the greatest thing. He, I think he's only, I think his record's only three and one. Three and one. Now, granted, Ruth was a was a, a pitcher only for a period of time, but stop trying to always compare this to that. And it's like, Jesus, can like stop already. Yeah. No, I'm with you. And it wouldn't, it went, I don't know why it, it, it makes my ears bleed, but like this whole show, you hear this all the time. Oh, he's a good comp. Oh, comp this, comp that. I'm like, stop saying that. Stop saying these words. Just, oh my God. Oh, what's his comp? I'm like, oh my goodness. We, the terminology is just, yeah, it drives me nuts. So it drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. So that's why I like, I'd much rather watch a, a nice just college baseball game and sit there and enjoy it and see what Eric Sorensen's going to say. Yeah. Sorensen's great. <laughs> I ran into him. I was umpiring a, a division two game of all things. And <laughs> this was years ago and I'm walking off the field and there's Sorensen taking photos. And I'm like, Hey, Stitchhead, what's up? Big fan of yours. And, and I had the plate and I had, I, I don't know, I bowled like a, a, a two hour and 10 minute game or something. And he was like, yeah, oh, big fan of yours, you know, nice quick game. <laughs> and then he had this write up in his, uh, this was years ago. He did like three strikes or something. And the uh -huh. very last one was, uh, plate umpire Matt Hersema because he was talking about he went to this division two weekend because there was no d1 baseball I think that time and and so he said yeah I was a big fan of Matt's thanks for you know being a fan of uh, the stitch head podcast or whatever it was so one of my favorite memories is meeting him running into him and uh, that quick conversation no so. he's great he's great Mike and I had him on our uh, we did a documentary on Rosenblatt and we had him on our on our documentary and then I've had him on my podcast in november when we weren't even sure there was going to be a baseball season okay so it was, it was interesting for us to talk about like what's it gonna what's it gonna be yeah like nobody knew like you know we were worried we we're gonna be eating bark and dogs you know like, <laughs> we didn't know what the hell was going on we were still worried about toilet paper i forgot you guys did oh my goodness yeah the, the mob was crazy that i forgot you guys did that documentary on rosenblatt that was fantastic can can yeah. people still find that somewhere yeah it's on youtube and you can find it on vimeo uh it's still out there yeah it's uh it goes back to my dislike for espn tv is like <laughs> mike and i mike and i wanted to do one it was the last year of rosenblatt and you would think espn that covers it would put some real effort into it because they're they're ESPN and they can just say, Hey, we're ESPN. Would you do an interview with us? And they would. And they didn't find out the real story of why Rosenblatt shut down because they didn't want to expose anybody. And that's what, what Mike and I wanted to do is like, why is this real gem is going away? And I, and I hate the, the fact that now everybody's got an agenda on even the most simplest things of like why a stadium is being shut down. Yeah and how the NCAA, you know, runs the ship. It's just like, come on, just be honest up front with your audience. Love God. We're not that dumb. <laughs> Did you just ask ESPN to be honest? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I know. know. Come on, Matt. You, you, can't, you can't expect that. I mean, uh, come on now. Uh, I know. You I know. Just... Ask Rachel. She's sitting at home. And she can't, <laughs> she's at, uh, can't talk about the NBA finals, I guess, privately. Yeah, I know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, ESPN is it's been disappointing the past few years to see kind of where where it's gone. It used to be my favorite channel, you know, oh, on, yeah. all the time. And now I don't watch it unless you know there's a specific game on that channel. It's just uh too much for me, man. i oh. I, I can't take it. <laughs> Absolutely. What Absolutely. was your documentary called on, on uh, Rosenblatt for people? remembering Rosenblatt? Remembering Rosenblatt on YouTube or or uh yeah, or three Vimeo. part. There's a three-part series, and then the, the, we did a fourth one where Mike and I actually talked about the process and what it took to, to do it. Because wow. it was a it was a whirlwind kind of event because we were hoping to go with the baseball team, and then they lost to UCLA. Uh, so Mike and I were like, "Well, we got tickets. We're going." I remember this. Yeah, <laughs> it was funny. In uh, in '08, I graduated college at Fullerton, and my buddy Todd Carson and I we'd always been big Fullerton fans. We loved the College World Series, and as a graduation gift uh, to me, he, he, you know, got us flights and uh, hotels. We went out to, uh, in 08, the, to the college world series. And I was working uh, in the press box at Fullerton. They lost to Stanford in the, in the super yes. regionals. 
And Greenlee turns to me, he's like, he's like, sorry, Maddie, because he knew I was going. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm still going. And I don't know who I'm going to root for. And then this team up in Fresno uh, made a magical run. So it was a still memorable experience for me to be at Rosenblatt. That place is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I love about college baseball is you can have a team like that out of nowhere. Uh huh. Nobody expected Fresno State to do that. Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> and they just got hot and steamrolled through that tournament. That was so, so cool. Uh, yeah. Check out the, the Rosenblatt documentary. You guys, uh, even if you're not a college baseball fan from a historical standpoint, I mean, it's one of the uh, most sacred grounds in all of the college athletics, I think. Matt, you talked about boxing earlier, a little background. Now your favorite sports, do you kind of, you still kind of tune into uh, to boxing these days? What are your, what are your thoughts on the state of boxing? There's still boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> um, the I, I do. I do. I do still follow boxing. I still love it. Um, I, I, I still love to get in the ring and mix it up, but uh, boxing did it to itself. Mm. It killed itself slowly killed itself um, by having 40 different belt titles instead of one. Right. Yeah. I mean, you and I can have a belt, uh, make up a belt, you know, the, <laughs> you name it, the I M M M B B four belt, whatever. Like you just, you know, there's the California, I remember photographing one time, the California heavyweight championship. Like the, there was a, there was a belt for heavyweights in California. I remember photographing it in, in uh, at uh, LA County fair in Pomona. And it's like, Jesus Christ, does everybody get like, are there 50 states that have a heavyweight title belt? Like it just, they did it to themselves. Um, UFC came on at the right time. Yeah. And it, just marketed itself brilliantly um you know and by controlling and allowing people like a don king to be in your sport uh you know i i know people always get like oh uh, the shady parts of like men's college basketball or, or football okay you could be a little shady you have an open thug like don king in your sport and you're cool with that like yeah. Like Jesus, like straight up thug mobster, you know, uh, African dictator. Like he's just, uh, you know, he probably ran Uganda at some point. Like he's just that kind of guy and you allow him in your sport. Like, are you kidding? Yeah. I can't imagine why your sport went to the, into the toilet and got flushed. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Cause if you don't keep up with the times, uh, and you kind of live on this, you're living in the past. I mean, yeah, people are not going to, going to tune in. It is interesting. I got in, involved in, uh, or became a fan of, of fighting boxing and MMA later in life or later in my life, I should say. And, um, I've really enjoyed it. I like both. They're two different sports. You know, they're not the same. No, nope. I've said before that Dana White and to me, he's the best leader in sports. That guy knows how to run a product, knows what people want. And, uh, I think boxing could learn a thing or two from him. They, they should, they don't want to, they don't want to fall. Boxing is so dumb. They don't want to follow its footsteps and understand like, wow, maybe, maybe we should minimize how many belts we have and get the product, uh, make it better. Um, look long-term at our product and what it needs. They don't do that. I mean, I remember I, as a kid going to the Olympic auditorium, going to the uh, forum and watching fights, even when they had like a Pachanga a couple of times, I went there and covered fights. Um, but I've taken my kids to like UFC stuff and it's, it's the best. It's by far a better product. They, the way they put it on is absolutely like it's hype videos are worth going to sometimes more than the match. You go to boxing and it's the same run by the same stale people. Like, can we just try something? Anything. Yeah. Anything. Come on. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's not gone in a good direction. It used to be this arguably maybe the most popular sport in the country. And sure. you know, now it's like, Oh, what, it's, what's on who's fighting. If you were the heavyweight champ at any point from, you know, 1905 to whenever you were the, you were the guy in sports, you were the man mm -hmm. right from uh, you name it. Like that was the guy. Even if it was Leon Spinks, like you were the man. Now I bet people can't name the three guys fighting in the heavyweight. Yeah, like it's just, yeah. yeah. They're probably still one of those Klitschko brothers still fighting. <laughs> Maybe. 
Who are some fighters you liked? You, I mean, it's maybe been a while or if you're not following it anymore or whatever, but who are some fighters that you liked some of your favorite fighters? And then maybe, you know, who are now too? Well, I was fortunate. I grew up in those times where, you know, Tyson in those eighties, Sugar Ray, uh, Duran, Thomas, that Thomas sugar fight, uh, you know, some good stuff. Uh, uh, we just lost him. He just passed away, but marvelous Marvin Hagler. Marvin. I mean, good Lord. I mean, what a gentleman that those were monster fights. Um, I did a Shane Mosley fight uh, against this guy up in the sports or at the uh, Staples center. It was a, it was a battle. Um, but I always used to, I always used to get the fights. I always used to love, I would always tell Carlos, the fighting writer at the register, like, Hey man, I, I want the fight. Get me the fight. Whatever it is, I'll do it. <laughs> I used to do the fights when they were at OC Fair. I loved it. I love watching guys beat the snot out of each other. And yeah, you know, I, I would shoot them anywhere, anytime. Yeah. yeah. Um, I shot uh, Chavez. Uh, I shot um, was it Bradley uh, when he because he was out of Palm Springs. Um, oh great! Um, who's oh the Golden Boy? I'm blanking on his name, but uh, Oscar. I, yeah, Oscar photographed him. Uh, a couple of his fights of the forum and when he fought Chavez and yeah, I've just, uh, I've just enjoyed it. Now I've only done, this is weird. I did like UFC seven and then I haven't done anything since I did one at the forum where like uh, Schwarzenegger was there like um, Stallone and a couple of models. Like it was, and it was like two thousand maybe 99 it was like really bare bones they didn't even have a media room i had to go to roscoe's chicken and waffles across the street and uh send my photos out because they didn't even have a media room set up um but i haven't done anything uh recently um just because i just no one's no one's willing to pay for it but i've got friends that cover it um i know the 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 two main photographers uh that cover for the ufc and they do some great work. The UFC does absolutely brilliant job marketing. Oh yes, hands down. And and man, some of those some of those photos in uh, in fighting have got to be great with the guy you know taking a shot or whatever. <laughs> cool you stuff. know the ones I like the most is you know everybody goes for that right like the face impact stuff, but uh, it's the it's the aftermath photos of what his face looks like, you know after the after the fight or. Or, or during the press conference when the swelling is starting to get enormous you know it's like oh my god what happens to that body yeah oh my goodness yeah i i, I can't even imagine i stub my toe <laughs> walking around i'm like i'm out for weeks uh <laughs> that uh man this is uh by the way the the kings have you seen that on showtime i think it was it's about Hagler, hearns roberto duran four parts i yeah spectacular yeah. Talking about spectacular. that golden age. Some, some of the, yo, absolute, uh, some of the best boxing happened during those times. Indeed. Absolutely. And then, you know, to, to, to get boxing even straightened out where UFC doesn't have this advantage and it's coming up in a couple of weeks is the Olympics. Like the Olympics used to be the breeding ground for the next round of great fighters. The Olympics need to straighten its ass out because you can't have guys getting cheated at the Olympics. And then that just hurts your sport, right? It, it, you, if you know from immediately there was a stain at the Olympics when this guy's an amateur, how is there not going to be a stain throughout their professional career? Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Like you've got to have a clean sport all the way through. And I've always thought like the Olympics being like the breeding ground for the next round of boxers needs to get its shit together. Oh, amen to that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Matt, I, this has been a lot of fun, man. We've gone almost two hours here. Honestly, I could talk, <laughs> I could talk with you another two hours. Honestly, that's we, how we have a part two. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, but, uh, finally, uh, for our, for our listeners out there, I talked about Matt Brown photo.com can see a lot of your work. Uh, where can they find you on Instagram? What is your, uh, five Brown crew five so it used to be the, yeah, it used to be the family. Instagram page when before all the kids had phones. So it's just five the number and then Brown crew. Um, and that's where every, because there's five of us. So that's wherever, that's where everything's at. And nice. All kinds of good stuff gets posted there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, I've seen some great work there and yeah, if you want to see great photography or, uh, or whatever, some great stuff from Matt Brown, uh, the podcast, 
uh, just a good conversation. Wherever you listen to podcasts, be sure to check that out. Uh, I know that it is definitely a great product. That uh, uh, You're going to hear some great, great stories, as you mentioned uh, with me earlier today. And, and Matt, finally, uh, you know, hey, I hope you're you're okay there hobbling around. We didn't talk about it, but I, you know, you're a, uh, you're a little, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, we can show them the, look uh, at the cast oh. boot here. Did you get yeah. run over again or what? No, that, that's what happens when, uh, you run too many marathons and play too many sports that, uh, a bone spur develops in your Achilles tendon over, over the years. And so they, we had it removed on Thursday. And so I'm on a, I'm on a PTO for the week. I got to stay off the foot and I'll be in a boot and I'll be back to normal soon. But, uh, it could be worse. I got a great uh, nurse who's taking care of me and I've been playing Call of Duty for the last 72 hours. So just so killing Nazis, doing my part. Atta boy, atta boy. Uh, yeah, and that's the beauty of podcasting is you can you can do it, uh, you know, from a chair if you're uh, wounded a little bit. So right. uh, absolutely. Looking forward to more shows, Matt. Uh, I will tune in and thank you so much for doing this. I, I say this a lot, but I really do mean this. This has been one of my favorite conversations, uh, just covering everything. It's been so much fun. And just thank you and good luck with uh, your podcast. I'll be checking it out soon. I appreciate it, Matt. It's my pleasure. Good luck on yours. I, I always can do this anytime you want to talk. I, I think more people need to do this. Just set your phone down and talk to either the neighbor, a friend, something. Call up a longtime friend. Just have a conversation with them. That's it, man. That's it. Absolutely. Well said. We will talk to you very soon. And uh, yeah, man, take care. All right, buddy. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Take care. All right, Matt. Bud. See Bye. You. Well, an absolute pleasure. I really do mean that. That was so much fun chatting with Matt Brown, uh, Mr. Photographer, the, uh, the professional that he is in his line of work and some great, uh, man, some great stories, some great uh, viewpoint. He and I are very like-minded. Hadn't really talked with him uh, at great length before, but I look forward to chatting with him again very, very soon. And by all means, guys, please check out his podcast. I've, uh, I did a little, I listened a little bit here, but I want to dive in uh, and listen to a bunch of those episodes because uh, I think you'll, you'll, be, you'll be better for it, definitely, from uh, learning and listening to other people and having a good conversation. Uh, MattBrownPhoto.com and his uh, Instagram page. Um, check those out for some great photos and uh, just some, if you're a sports fan, there's a, there's a ton of good stuff to see. And uh, one of the best in the business, Matt Brown. Thanks again, Matt. Look forward to checking out your podcast. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. We will see you on Monday with the latest edition of the Get Home Safe podcast. But until then, guys, no matter what you're doing, whether you're out on the town or around in third base, get home safe.